but may not have may not have fully embraced. I've come here tonight to propose to you that you have arrived on the planet. I don't mean just in this hall tonight. You've come to the hall tonight to be reminded, but that you've arrived on the planet, on the earth, at this point in time, to live out this your lifetime for a particular reason larger than the reasons that we often thought. For a reason so much bigger than, you know, get the guy, get the girl, get the car, get the job. For a reason so much larger than the living of our normal lives that most of us cannot conceive of it or grasp it or embrace it, much less experience it until we do. And when we do, everything in our day-to-day -day begins to shift and change. Things begin to have a different sense of importance, a different feeling, a different priority. And we begin to feel like we are truly in this world, but not of it. But then we feel loose, kind of like at loose ends, not quite knowing where to go with that energy. Now what? Now what? Now what do I do? Now where do I go with that? What's next? And if I truly am here, on a divine mission, and that's what I'm suggesting to you tonight, if you haven't picked up on it already, I'm suggesting to you that you are here, sir, on a divine mission. That you have come here on an assignment from the largest part of us that some people call God, or divinity if you please, for a particular reason and purpose having very little to do with the living of your day-to-day -day life. Although the purpose will be expressed and fulfilled through the living of your day-to-day -day life. An interesting dichotomy. So I've come here tonight, really, to remind you of what you already know. And then to see if I can't answer a question, yeah, but so what? I mean, how do I, how do I implement that? How do I make that become real in my physical experience? Because that's what I find that people are asking all over the world. Neil, I hear you. I understand. I've got the basic truths. We are all spiritual beings. We are all souls, if you please, or spirits with a body. We're all on an eternal journey. We're all on an eternal path. And all of that stuff that we all already know. But how can I alter the living of my moment-to-moment -moment life in such a way that I begin to express that in, as, and through me in such a way that the world who, that I touch is never the same again. Not so that I may be made grand or glorious, but so that the world that I touch may be. Because currently, right now, there are people who have other thoughts and other plans in mind for the world in which we live. And there are other things going on that have been created by a lot of us over years gone by with which we are now being confronted that also must be addressed. Who shall do that? Who shall change our collective experience of life on this planet? And the answer is you, and you, and you unless it's not. And so we'll talk a bit about that tonight. But first, if I could just back up and set the stage just a little bit, let me just share a tiny bit about what is true, about what you already know, just to make sure that what you know and what I know is the same thing. I, I pretty much think that it is. There is one central question in life I have been told in my conversations with God. Well, first let me back up one big step from there. There is a God. If there isn't a God, let me be struck dead right here. There is a God. See, that's an interesting statement. If there isn't a God, let me be struck dead right here. Who would be striking me dead? See, who would be, who would be doing that? The devil. So stepping way back, there is a God. And this God that there is, is in no way separate from any of us. And that is an astonishing, if not to say a revolutionary, theological construction. The construction of a deity 
of divinity of a divine being or what we call God or Allah or Yahweh or whatever word we want to use, that, that theological construction of a God who is in no way separate from us is, I want to tell you, revolutionary. For most of the world's people who believe in a God at all, believe in a God of separation. This is called separation theology. God is over there, and we're over here. Our job is to get back to the God who's over there, someplace, somewhere. We are not that. We are this. We may admit to being sons of God or children of God, if you please, but we are not God. We are not that. That's that, and this is this. And that's the basic theology that has been embraced and adopted by the largest number, by far the largest number of the world's people. It's what I call separation theology. And separation theology is what has created separation cosmology and separation sociology and separation pathology. A pathology of separation that says that God is separate from us, we are separate from God, we are separate from that which God is, which is life. We are, we are experiencing life, but we are not that. We are experiencing God, but we are not that. We are experiencing each other, but we are not that. That is that, and we are us. And separation theology and separation sociology and separation pathology has created a distancing of each of us from each other of us in such a way that we have stepped away from the reason we're here on the earth, which was, in fact, to experience our unity and the oneness of all of life. Now, again, as I said earlier, this wouldn't matter if it didn't have any fallout felt by and experienced by the largest number of us, but in fact, all over the world, we are now seeing the increasing and extraordinary impact of that sense of separation. We're seeing what separation theology can do to humanity. Divide and conquer. And so we see people who not only separate themselves from each other and from their God, but in that moment of separation begin doing what you cannot do if you're unified, and that's comparing. We begin to compare ourselves with each other and compare our various gods with all the other people's various gods. And then we do something quite insidious if what we really seek is peace and harmony. Insidiously enough, although we say we seek peace and harmony, we say in the next breath, my God is better than your God. I have the right God and you have the wrong God. I, hate, I don't know how to tell you this in a gentle way, but in fact, my God is right and your God is right. But your God is so wrong that you're going to hell <laughs> for believing in your God. I grew up in the paradigm of a Catholic God. Are there any Catholics or former Catholics in the room? Okay, now, please lock the doors. Because I'm going to have to ask you to not leave the room, even if you become offended, because I want to tell you about some of the beliefs of my Catholic God. I was a, born and raised a Roman Catholic, and I was an altar boy, actually, if you can believe that. And when I was around 11 years old, or 12 years old, I remember that the first McDonald's opened in my neighborhood up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Are any of you old enough to remember when the very first McDonald's opened in your neighborhood? 